the city, of course, is always in constant flux. I'm sure. I mean, I wasn't here before I was born, but I imagine it was changing a lot then too, probably even faster. And I think for me, one of the biggest things that I had to realize was that the, the city changes faster than I do. And I have these, these, these moments that were really, I guess, poignant for me um, as a teenager when I was just starting to get my bearings in the city and, you know, bike across the city or go out on the metro and travel around with friends and, and explore a little bit on my own. And first I had the experience of sort of stitching together all of these different neighborhoods that I'd experienced um, through, you know, with my parents or with, with friends, different experiences, but realizing how they're all connected. But then I started to have this really um, unsettling experience of looking for certain landmarks and not being able to find them. Um, and the example that I remember the most is the flea market in the old port on Pier 16. And when I was a little kid, my dad would take me down to the flea market and there was like these hundreds of little booths and they sold, you know, old books and little knickknacks and toys and, and like everything you could imagine under the sun. And when I was around 16, I thought, you know, this is great. My friends are going to love this. We're going to go and we're going to look at all this crazy junk and going down to the old port and searching and searching and not being able to find it and just feeling so lost because it never occurred to me that something that was part of the city could have been taken away. I just assumed that I was lost, that I wasn't able to find it. It was only maybe years later that I realized, okay, there is no flea market anymore. I wasn't lost. It was the city that was changing. Um, and I could come up with hundreds of examples, like, well, not hundreds, but dozens of examples, you know, um, like abandoned lots on Sherbrooke Street downtown here that we just recognized. That was the lot with the old mattresses in it. It was always there. And then one day it wasn't there. And is that because you're not on the same block of Sherbrooke? Because you don't know when you're young, when you're just discovering the city, you don't realize how fast it can change. And I think at first I was really kind of torn up about the idea that all of these places that I hadn't even had a chance really yet to discover and to make my own were like slipping away and disappearing before I could even, you know, grasp them. But now, of course, I mean, the only thing you can do in a situation like that is, you know, like in any relationship, just accept that things are going to change and you just, you know, you have to, I guess, accept that about the, about the, the one you love. <laughs> it's going to change and you just got to roll with it. Ever since I started working on gentrification, I have um, kind of a particular take on an analysis, and I and and uh, the area, the angle that I've always been interested in is trying to figure out. Well, we know that the people involved in gentrification are middle class; that they are higher income than the people who were there before. Other that, and that is what generates the whole dynamic of displacement because one group has higher market pressure than the other, and it also has usually um, better, uh, 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 um, more resources to get organized and get what they want in the neighborhood, which isn't necessarily the same as what the existing residents want, and so on and so forth. But what I've always been interested in is why is it, well, we have, we have the middle class that's changing and evolving, and why is it that some part, some within the middle class, we have some groups that are quite happy to go and live in the suburbs, and others that want to that want to establish themselves in the inner city where they become identified with gentrification. And my analysis on this has been coming way back that that it is linked to changes in lifestyles in a broad sense. It's linked to changes in the family. It's linked to the growth in non-traditional households. We have a situation where in North American cities, not as bad in, in Canada as in the United States, but in but in North American cities, there was this whole period where the suburbs were developed for this very standardized model of the of the middle class with the stay-at-home mother and the minivan and 2.4 children and uh, tracked housing and the shopping center and so on and so forth. I think I've been on all sides of the gentrification debate. Um, well, not the debate, of the gentrification experience. When I was a kid, uh, we lived in St. Henry. We got kicked out of an apartment in St. Henry. We got kicked out of another apartment in St. Henry. We got, you know, lease terminated on an apartment in Little Burgundy because the landlord was renovating because the landlord wanted a place for his daughter, supposedly. 
Um, we got kicked out of a place in NDG. We even got kicked out of a place in Beaconsfield that got turned into an old folks home. Um, so we were pushed around a lot when I was young. My parents were students. We didn't have a lot of money. Uh, they were unemployed sometimes. And so I think my mom had a great knack for de finding these neighborhoods that had a really wonderful vibrancy, like um, the, the little Parc Jacques Cartier in St. Henry. And of course, these neighborhoods were just being snapped up by um, you know, different landlords or maybe developers who were starting that gentrification process. So we definitely got moved around a lot by gentrification um, as a kid. And then my parents split up and at one point my dad moved to the plateau. And at this point, you know, it's the late 80s, early 90s and my dad's this wannabe writer and he lives with his actor friend and they live in this cockroach infested apartment on Fabre. And that's the first wave of gentrification that hits the plateau. And I would go there as a kid at, you know, nine, 10 years old and walk up and down Mount Royal and see the shops open and close and open and close. And, and um, you know, we bought brie cheese and coffee. And <laughs> I guess we were part of that first wave of gentrification. I mean, there's certainly a sense that we were not, you know, the characters out of Michel Tremblay's novel that lived on Fabre 20 years before that. And now I've just moved into Rosemont and, you know, I'm a young university educated professional and I can't, you know, I, I like to have access to a coffee shop with internet and I like to have access to fruits and vegetables in my neighborhood. So, I mean, I really can't say I'm against gentrification because as much as I've been pushed around by gentrification, I'm also an agent of gentrification. I've been interested in gentrification in the early eight since the early 80s when I was a very uh, uh, a very young researcher and and uh, I was um, I was teaching my first courses in urban geography and I would include gentrification as a topic that would uh, that would really get the students interested in in, in thinking critically about how uh, how uh, inner cities, areas of, uh, could go through uh, such cycles, these cycles of decline and then uh, uh, revitalization spurred uh, initially by, uh, by individuals who for different reasons wanted to quote unquote come back to the city and then how eventually that process would get taken over by, uh, by developers and other in individuals inst interested in making a profit and I would get the students uh, involved in this. and. Uh, and then when I moved to Montreal, which was in the early 1980s, in the middle of a huge recession, there was nonetheless signs of gentrification happening on a small but noticeable scale. And uh, I started to monitor it, follow it, ride around and take photos of uh, places being in the process of being converted with municipal renovation grants. You know, Montreal, there's, there's very little single family housing in the gentrifying neighborhoods. So a lot of it, most of it take, took place through undivided co-ownership or through duplexes. Whereas in other Canadian cities, there's a lot more single family housing stock. And so you would have a lot more, um, a lot more people who would be buying single family houses. Though there is some in Montreal, but there's not much relatively, which is why the whole question of condos is so crucial to gentrification in Montreal. The more uh, famous uh, example is the Plateau Mont Royal, which used to be like a, a working class sector or a, uh, a poor, uh, popular uh, neighborhood. And now it's um, they've been build, build, building uh, condos and condos, and uh, uh, the people with uh, less money have to uh, to to move away. And uh, it's the the same process. Um, uh, that we've seen here in uh, Saint Henri, it's not um, it's not totally done like it is like in the Plateau Mont Royal, but it's something that it's currently uh, going on. Um, we've made a, a research uh, last summer to uh, to uh, try to make a list of all the empty lots or the the empty um, uh, yeah the empty. Um, ground in, uh, in Saint Henri and uh, since last summer uh, part of them have been um, uh, transformed uh, in condos in the last like uh, 10 years it's maybe um, 2000 uh, condos that have been uh, built uh, in the sector uh, mostly around the Canal Lachine or the 
um, the, the industrial uh, vacant uh, buildings. We're, we're fighting this because uh, 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 there's, there's people that have been living here for like a generation uh, that used to work in the, the industry that have closed and now uh, they've been chasing away f by, uh, by the people. Uh, you know, there's new, um, new restaurants or new um, uh, commerce uh, that opens that are not uh, accessible for uh, people that used to live here. We cannot talk about uh, a process of gentrification in the Southwest because throughout the past 25, 30 years, uh, there was a lot of social and community housing that was built. When the new, uh, when when the the private housing development has started to pick up after the, you know the the announcement of the reopening of the canal, but basically after the reopening of the canal, so starting like around 2002, um, the the pace of building social and community housing was still uh, very uh, was kept up so that uh, there is a, a fairly good balance uh, between private housing condo development and social and community housing so far i think that we have uh, been able to uh, uh, to avoid you know uh, the, the classic gentrification process where newcomers are uh, making people leave you know like lower income uh, uh, people uh, leave and I don't think that's how that, that's happened so far. There's a buzz around uh, Saint-Henri, it's, uh, it's trendy, it's uh, cool to be here and uh, um, we've seen many uh, different type of people that's coming in uh, like uh, lux, uh, luxury uh, restaurants and um, you know because it's really close to the, uh, the downtown uh, it's uh, easy to access with the metro or the the highways. So uh, there's a there's a buzz uh, around uh, Saint Henri, and uh, we've seen actually there's a new movie that uh, that starts to, um, which I think I didn't see it yet, but uh, I think it's a, it's a good movie. But it's only part of uh, you know uh, um, people wants to uh, to live here. It's um, so uh, of course. Um, the, it have an effect on the, uh, uh, you know, when more people wants uh, the apartment, uh, the landlords could uh, increase the, the rent uh, easily and they will find people to, to rent it. Uh, so um, the taxes are really uh, going up. So uh, the, the, the landlords uh, refill that to, um, to the, the tenants uh, by increasing the rents. Throughout the Southwest, there's, we, we figure there's uh, about 10,000 new units housing units that will be built in the next 10 years and it's it's already started and it's going to pick up very much in the next uh, few years you know there's the new uh, bassin du nouveau Havre with 2000 unit uh, you have uh, the griffin town the district griffin town with uh, over a uh, thousand unit you have the lonies uh, different phases with more than 500 units so if you look at that on a global perspective for the southwest it's a, it's a very important change and again in all these large projects we always make sure that there is be between 15 which is the minimum of the strategy by the, the city and 25 percent of social or community housing so that you know there's room for everybody and of course, when we talk about revitalization of renewal, it's important as well as keeping the people who are there, of being able to have new people coming in and re, uh, rebalancing, you know, the, 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 the whole community. You know, six years ago, they came here with billion dollar projects, or if you include the casino, even eight years ago, uh, they came here with a couple of billion dollar projects. and. Uh, uh, nothing, there's no shovels been put into the ground and no real changes. What has happened economically to the neighborhood is that uh, most of the landlords, of which I am one of course, uh, have lost their tenant base because most of the tenants thought that these were all done deals 
and as their leases came to an end, they uh, realized they, they thought to themselves that they were going to have to uh, vacate or they were going to get thrown out of the various locations that they occupied in the neighborhood. And the neighborhood went from being uh, almost totally leased out to being 60 or 70 percent vacant other than owner tenant people who own the buildings that still occupy them. You talk about gentrification. I don't know about that's taking place in Griffintown yet because there wasn't enough housing to gentrify. It was a, a lot of the housing um, is now being eyed by a different class of population who find it interesting. It's an area 10 minutes from downtown. Um, prices were, were accessible and um, a new generation is moving in. After six years, the Vimco has actually torn down an old building, uh, removed another six or eight businesses from the neighborhood. They still haven't put a shovel in the ground, though. Uh, this, is, this is their second so-called group of projects. The first one's collapsed after two years. And uh, now it's, th again, three years later, and they've, like I said, they've demolished two buildings and emptied the neighborhood out a little bit more. Preville uh, and some, somebody else at Canada Lands are starting to sell. They have a sales office and they're starting to sell uh, condos in advance of the project that they're going to be building along the canal. Uh, uh, that's going to be eight buildings, uh, three 22-story towers and a bunch of 14 and 8-story buildings. It's now been hired by a developer to radically uh, rebuild the area, but with a, obviously a different population in mind because the original population is gone. And in fact, a kind of new set of pioneers has uh, set up house in, in Griffintown. They've uh, one or two family houses, uh, uh, an old factory has been renovated for housing, and um, they're very active. They're sort of a, a, a keen group now to uh, defend the rights of uh, of the neighborhood they are trying to establish. But uh, the De Vimco project, which was uh, agreed to by the, the city of Montreal, uh, their approach was to build a massive high-density, high-rise development. Uh, and the city seemed to be unaware of uh, what was actually taking place. They just were glad to see a, a developer. It was a traditional poor working class neighborhood for the most part. You had big industry built up along because of the canal and because of the new city gas, which was power. Uh, you had a whole industrial parks on the edge of what was Montreal, which was old Montreal. Uh, it was the first suburb of Montreal, I suppose. And uh, you had this industrial base, which brought a lot of poor laborers, or poorer, I should say, laborers, because it offered jobs, and there was no subway, and there was no cars, and there was no way. So they lived across the street and down the street and whatever. It was mostly Irish, but certainly not Irish. There was big Polish communities here, Jewish communities here. There's all kinds of uh, I, people that, that, that passed through here. It was, I mean, it's, it's at the foot of the port, so it's... You know, and it was uh, poor, so the f the housing was more affordable than uptown, and and whatever. And uh, people made their lives here, and they raised their families. And there was the Irish community was the big community, and it's still the one that still has some remnants of it. There's a big Irish society, and, and whatever that 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 counts Griffin Town as one of their uh, icons, so to speak, that they they look back on. And there were boys and girls clubs, there were schools, there was, uh, I think there was 11 churches in the neighborhood of different denominations, which shows how many different kinds of people there were. And um, all of that stuff has slowly disappeared, uh, mostly because of Drapeau and Expo 67. Um, but uh, also a lot of it was very dilapidated. I mean, uh, there was some reason to, to knock it down. But you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, Montreal's most successful neighborhoods are the Plateau or NDG or Rosemount or whatever. They're all two and three stories high. They're streets that people feel like walking around and they're, they're not loaded with Walmarts. And there's an awareness, there's an attempt to incorporate uh, that kind of, you know, be it, um, transportation demand management, making a place, you know, more accessible by transit and bicycle and so on, um, be it 
this whole lead architecture infrastructure like there is a you, you hear about it more right in a in a development it'll often have these sort of elements integrated um, some of that I think there's a sense is a little bit of a greenwashing situation where when it comes down to it is the actual building itself you know is it is it durable is it gonna last is it gonna be still standing in 50 years or a hundred years and more importantly is it the kind of building that we're gonna want to be there in 50 years or a hundred years um, and the, to me what concerns me about condos is mostly that I often look at them and I go like I don't think that thing's gonna be standing in 50 years or if it is it's gonna be crumbling and falling down and all these people who have invested some absurd amount of money in their condo are well they're gonna lose their investment I think because who's gonna you know you you can say the real estate market's a great investment but when it comes down to it buying this like material and if it's falling down in 50 years no one's gonna want it so I mean that's definitely a concern of mine my take on it is this that since the since the late 1970s which is the end called the end of the drapo period the city of Montreal has been extremely um, concerned about its population decline relative to the suburbs and also, I mentioned to you, I moved to Montreal in the early 80s in the middle of a recession that, you know, basically continued off and on from 1976 until until uh, until the late 1990s with just a few little periods of boom in between. And so the city has always been very concerned about its population decline and this this metaphor of Montreal being the hole in the donut of the metro Montreal metropolitan area. And what can the city do to reverse population decline and ensure that it doesn't lose its middle class? And so that's the broader context in which you have to place the city of Montreal's policy in regards to supporting uh, housing, middle class housing construction, including the type that we would associate with gentrification. And it started in the early 80s with a program that you might have heard about called Operation 20 000 Logements that was uh, started un started under the um, Drapeau and Yvon Lamar administration and it was it was continued and adapted in uh, different forms by subsequent administrations but in a way that in fact has been remarkably consistent for for the past uh, for the past 30 years what has actually happened is that um, Montreal rental housing has become massively less affordable in the past 10 years and then there have been there has been research done that relates that the price of rental housing to people's incomes, and the conclusion is that Montreal has become um, a much less affordable city in terms of its rental housing compared to about ten years ago. And this development has, I think, probably taken the city and the Montreal metropolitan community by surprise, and it is it is. Uh, it has led to increasing difficulties for, for lower and modest income people, especially lower and modest income families with children. My parents live in the plateau. They have three kids, while well, two of them still live with them. And yeah, I mean, they've lived there for 15 years, so they have an affordable rent. Um, and I think, you know, now they definitely have to stay put because they're never gonna find that rent anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, of course you want people to be able to afford to live somewhere. I don't know how you would deal with it. I know there's you know, there is rent control and there is a lot of laws in place to protect citizens. Um, my experience is that it's not always feasible to really um, implement them. And that's just a situation like it's happened to me where, you know, somebody buys your building and they want you out and you can go fight them in court every year and probably win. But at some point you just it's not very pleasant to live in a place where you feel like your next door neighbor is just waiting for you to get the heck out so at some point i think you know you just give up and you don't want to put the effort into into fighting and fighting over the last 10 years we've developed close to 15,000 uh housing units uh social housing uh under the uh, government's uh it's a joint program between the uh, provincial, the, the federal, and the municipal governments, where uh, each one pays more or less a third into a pot, and we use this money to help develop uh, affordable housing, co-op, and social housing. And we've met our mandate, and we've surpassed it. 
but there is so much need that we are still in the process of creating more affordable housing for our citizens. And for every development that takes place, if there's no, uh, uh, if a, f a number of apartments are not developed for affordable housing, that developer has to uh, pay into this fund that will help create affordable housing elsewhere. Uh, the University of Montreal wants to build one of its campuses uh, in the old train yards, the Outremont train yards. Um, and it's a private project. There, It's a promoter. The University of Montreal is considered, a, is the promoter of the project. And the dialogue has been happening uniquely or up to recently with the city of Outremont because it's on actual Outremont territory. Because of um, public awareness and of discussions coming up, they have opened up and started talking to the neighboring boroughs, uh, Town of Montreal, Park X, uh, My Land, uh, so Rosemont Petite Patrie, but it's minimal. They are not necessarily the most, um, the, the promoter that wants to dialogue the most. When Loblaws developed right here uh, in 98, there was an outcry from some community groups that it will close the little mom and pop shops. Uh, all you have to do is just look around you and see how they flourished. Uh, and still, Loblaws is there uh, doing their business uh, with 33,000 people living in a very tightly knit society. Uh, believe me, everybody has to eat. Everybody needs certain services and there's uh, room for everyone. Uh, now, this will be on the other side of the train tracks. A new area between Van Horn and the train tracks will be developed. And there will be a need for such small shops to be able to give local services to the population there. And I'm sure there'll be opportunities for people from Park X who want to develop. The way it works is there's going to be the main campus, but then everybody has had perks. so. TMR, they'll have the overpass redone, okay? Um, and then Rosemont Petit Patrie, it's going to be the Atlantic District, and it's going to be the Alexandra Marconi District. That's beyond, that's the tracks, the end of the tracks over there. We're talking about the other side of, uh, so we're talking about the east side of Park Avenue. We're like no longer on campus territory. And that's one of the fall backs, fallouts, Whatever, one of the perks that the borough is getting. Of course, all of the gentrification that's going to come from this building is can be positive if it's um, if it's somehow um, not regulated, but if it's sort of controlled. If it's you know just. We want to keep on living in our community. I want to be able to live here. I want to be able to raise my son here, but I have to be able to afford to do so. If taxes go up, if rents go up, well, no, we won't be able to live in our own community. And I believe that we should be able to have access to it. I should be able to live here. They want to make sure that uh, the housing situation will not uh, somehow ricochet and increase rents in Park X because of a higher demand by students. We can't control that. I am a private homeowner in Park Extension. I own a triplex. I rent my two upper floors. I live on the first floor in the basement. My tenants have been there for one of them for five years, the other one for two years. It, no one's going to knock on my door asking to rent my apartments if I don't have a for rent sign. As long as my tenants stay there, I raise my rents according to the norm, according to what is determined by the uh, rental board. So I'm trying to understand and apply what the community groups are saying to my situation. So unless my people move out, I can't raise my rent more than 1.2 or 2% unless I make major renovations. And even so afterwards, if one of them decides to move out and I need to rent it, 
according to my, my situation, according to what the rental board sets out, I will raise my rent accordingly. So I'm trying to understand how real the concerns are and how it will apply. I can't put them out for no reason. So I can't make a vacancy and try to increase the rent with the new, uh, my new tenants. As a kid growing up, I would go to my grandparents' house here on Wiseman and we'd go to the corner, get pizza, the Greek, and um, so I have very strong memories of me as a child coming to Park X. And when I did eventually come back and move to Park X, I moved on Wiseman Street a bit uh, more south of where my grandparents used to live. And obviously the neighborhood by then had changed. So where we would go and buy the pizza, well, it was now an Indian restaurant. And you know, the things have changed and things are the same. But so I have a long history with Park X. A mix is good. I mean, I believe that a mix is good. I think, and this is straight out of Jane Jacobs, but I think she nailed it when she said that you know, when a community starts to really become gent you know, gentrified, when, when the problem starts to happen is when it's ruined by its own success. So rather than having an increasing diversity of, of services and businesses and offers, um, you know, you start to have a decreasing diversity as things like trendy restaurants start to completely outrun things like hardware shops and, and grocery stores. Um, and I don't know if there's a lot of neighborhoods in Montreal that have really, truly gotten to that point. It started with a developer buying up six square blocks of uh, what is now the co-ops and their project, those six square blocks. Um, in the middle and late 60s and uh, their plans were to tear it all down and to build high-rises to build three times what you now see uh, which is what you now see is an office building uh, what, what was a hotel and three uh, apartment buildings um, and the citizens became alarmed started door knocking started saying listen they're gonna wreck our neighborhood uh, and then there was a lot of activity for 10, for over 10 years, actually almost 15 years. There was a lot of protest in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, finally, um, it appeared that they were not going to be able to do the three, whole three phases that they wanted to do. Um, they did one phase, ran out of money, and so the rest of the buildings just sat. And they um, eventually, we convinced the government of Canada to buy, uh, buy them and turn them into cooperatives. So that began the beginning of the Milton Park Cooperatives, which is now 22 co-ops and non-profit corporate housing corporations. That was a neighborhood that was condemned by a City of Montreal planning report in the 1970s, if I remember correctly. And I think it's recounted in the book that they had brought on a consultant from the Ford Foundation who had applied this kind of American uh, lens to Montreal and said, this is a hopelessly declining de neighborhood. And you, uh, the best thing to do is to, uh, to get rid of all this so social pathology by uh, demolishing everything and building 16 high rise towers. There were, you know, and that was the same type of um, Certain neighborhood based social movement that you have you also saw in uh, in Toronto and Vancouver uh, and other and other cities in the in the 1960s and 1970s. And people in Milton Park were very active uh, and uh, the residents of the of the buildings that were going to be demolished were and so we occupied a uh, a space in Milton Park and had students doing uh, alternative plans for renovation and um, cooperative housing uh, and it worked in combination with the citizens group, the Milton Park citizens group uh, and eventually, uh, I mean we proposed things at City Hall too, we took our plans and discussed them with the, uh, I think it was Lucien Solny at the time who was um, Mayor Drapo's right hand man. Uh, but the, the main thrust came from the 
the residents who were going to be displaced in the area, who we marched alongside them with banners and placards, uh, but our, our contributions to show this is what could be done with the housing that exists. Uh, it, actually, the, we had little success with um, Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation until um, I think Phyllis Lambert provided money to, to back the citizens group. And uh, it was really their efforts and uh, their protests that, that won the day. We had sit-ins, we had hunger strikes, uh, some of us were arrested and we went to jail and had a trial, found not guilty, and then uh, another cycle of protests took place and so on and so forth. So we didn't, uh, we had a pause, but we didn't actually give up through, throughout it. In the, in the end, we won. The community, the Milton, what's called the Milton Park community, um, goes from university to St. Lawrence, say, whereas the project is, is six square blocks in the middle of that. So there's all of the housing uh, west of Hutchison, for example, where, where, which is the western end of the co-op project. That's what four streets are in there. Yeah, four streets, Hutchison, De Roche, Elmer, Lorne, University. There was the, the Overdale project on um, Boulevard René Lévesque, an enormous project which resulted in the demolition of existing housing. Residents at the time tried to block it, they barricaded themselves in, they, um, they were very active and forceful, but the so-called progressive um, uh, administration of the time, under uh, Doré, sent in the police. And the police went in with truncheons and helmets and, uh, and cleared the, the resistors out. So the buildings came down. Examine it today. There's nothing there. It's like laying fallow for 30 years. There were other cases of, of important urban struggles uh, that took place in other parts of the city which she was involved in directly and indirectly. Yeah, actually before that, 1966, I, I helped people who lived on Selby Street um, to uh, fight against uh, the, the destruction of similar kinds of housing, gray stones, um, in order to build the Ville Marie Expressway. We're, Milton Park is no longer alone. It, there's not a, there are not enough Milton Parks, uh, and there should be many more. But you see, what has to come across in any examination of Milton Park is the fact that it is unique in the following sense. Not only the scale, but also that it sits on what is called, what one could call a land trust. Namely... Now it does, it didn't. Yeah, the, I mean, that's part of the project. Yeah, yeah <clears throat> that the land is owned in common. All the 22 organizations together own all the land. And it is controlled all together. The individual buildings are owned by the different cooperatives, okay, the 22 organizations and non-profit corporations. And as a result of this land trust, this, uh, what some people have called this urban Soviet, <laughs> that's what we were accused of at the time, there can be no buying and selling of property in Milton Park. It's frozen. The six block area is frozen for the foreseeable future. Whereas demolition could take place quite easily, you know, 40 years ago. Um, there's been resistance in every case. And since uh, uh, the past what, 20 years, there's been the, the Office de la Consultation Publique established, which gives people the opportunity to, uh, to examine projects, to make the case f against them if necessary, or to modify them. And it served a very, very useful purpose. Uh, projects have been halted because of the, uh, the opportunity given to uh, residents and citizens groups to make the case before a, a body which is uh, arm's length. Uh, the city of Montreal has to observe the, the recommendations of the the Office de, de la Consultation, and um, it's halted certain projects, or it's modified projects, which otherwise would have gone ahead uh, 
uh, without without any any comment. The City of Montreal's policy for uh, trying to get mixed income developments. Uh, when developers want to get come in and develop new projects, especially if it involves a change in the zoning regulations, they have to get the neighbourhood on side. So there has to be a consultation process. What is interesting is, the question to ask is who gets involved in the consultation? And that's where the link with gentrification comes in, because if you start assisting promoters to develop uh, condominiums in inner city neighbourhoods that are still affordable, the city does that because they, or has done it because they believe that you need to have a little bit of economic stimulus and residential development in order to help to kickstart areas which have been in a long decline. The big issue is can you do that in such a way that you don't have an uncontrolled process of gentrification that will that will uh, that will set off uh, that will be set off by that process. There's always oppositions to, to 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 anything that you try to do. Somebody will always say, you know, it's not right. It's too big. It's too small. It's too high. It's too you know whatever. Yeah, there was some, uh, but I th I think you know it was it it went to public consultation. The whole development went to public consultation as the whole development area has gone to public consultation. Uh, but I think over, overall everybody sees that this is a big step forward for the for the area. You may have <clears throat> you may quibble about, you know, whether it should be twelve condos should be twelve stories high or, or ten stories high, but you know, basically I think everybody knows that it is going to clean the area up and, and that's what we want. In fact there is one former urban planning student called Isabel Corral, uh, who was the first person to ever do uh, research on gentrification in Montreal when she, in the early 1980s, and she did um, a study of uh, Shaughnessy Village, the area near what is now the Canadian Centre for Architecture, which was, um, those were relatively large grey stone houses, but they were extremely run down. And the people who moved into there were, from the outset, relatively wealthy because they were big houses and it took uh, a lot of money to bring them back up to shape. So that was your classic dual earner couple that would, uh, you know, dual professionals where you'd, they have a high income and they were able to take on such a big project. And then they formed the Shaughnessy Village Association and so on and tried to change the image of the area with mixed success, in fact. <laughs> you know, gentrification doesn't always go on this upward trajectory and, you know, it never stops. For many years um, it, it had a bad reputation because of uh, Cabot Square. Uh, for one thing, being uh, a, a venue for drugs. Um, the uh, Seville Theatre block on St. Catherine Street, uh, which gradually um, deteriorated over 20 years, uh, and we finally uh, got the city to knock it down and put up some, uh, some condos. Mm -hmm. So there is now um, a large uh, interest by the city and uh, Quebec government to revitalize the area of what we call Shaughnessy Village, which is from Guy Street to Atwater and from Sherbrooke down to Souvenir Street. I think uh, more is to be done. I, I, I mean, the energy that's uh, developing around here is good. I mean, to have a hole beside our shelter for 10 years uh, was just devastating because it's not very pleasant to, to know that people are sleeping out there in this, it was just délabré, it was old, it was infested with rats. I think these people should deserve better. Uh, to remove, put condos, you, you can easily forget about the problems that you just pushed aside. Uh, but we're there to remind them. Uh, homelessness doesn't just disappear. Uh, you have to really look at it and explain the problem and sit down a and the city of Montreal is sitting down in committees to look at it and to review what, what other measures needs to be deployed with the means that we have, which is very little. We have about 4,000 residents in the area and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, renters and it's one of the uh, most densely populated areas in Quebec with all the high-rises along the Maisonneuve that were built up in the 1960s. So there's an awful lot to manage, an awful lot of uh, people come and go, uh, but a, an awful lot of people do stay. Our, so our association has 300 people in it, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, we have a fair amount of clout, and I think that the politicians realize that, and they're now uh, finally 
um, paying attention with um, the, the plan that they have to revitalize uh, the whole area. Uh, Cabot Square is going to have a $5.5 million makeover. Um, we have uh, asked uh, our association, Shawn Civilian Association, we work very closely with our borough mayor, who is also the mayor of Montreal, Mayor Tremblay, and he's uh, now expressed a keen interest in um, revitalizing the area. We, put it, we get more and more families moving into the area, uh, young, young people with young children. So we're starting to uh, uh, look for um, playgrounds, uh, schools, library, um, and, and a safer place. So the, the, the big problem over the last 20 years has been that the place has been uh, thought of as unsafe, and to a certain extent it was. But now with the, um, with the um, condos being built on St. Catherine Street, it's added a whole different um, idea. It's, um, people are coming into uh, open businesses and open stores. Um, some of the um, stores along the uh, uh, along St. Catherine Street are being renovated, uh, so I think it's going to put a whole different uh, complexion on the on the area, which is going to be good. Rents uh, right now are increasing in, at a, an alarming rate, and that's one of the big concerns of the shelters because uh, the night shelters have different levels of programming, and at the last level. Uh, they should be able to go into an apartment, uh, an apartment that's affordable. But because we're not finding affordable apartments, the women are stuck in the shelters. And so they backlogs to the point where there's no space in the emergency beds. So yes, there's a big uh, problem with accessibility to, uh, to rent, but that, I think that's across Montreal. Right. And in the past year, we've seen uh, prices go up tremendously. And it's a concern for people that are living on the street and the students too that carry a heavy burden and a heavy debt. And we have to look at that. Um, the construction of the civil does bring some money for um, logements sociaux, but we yet have not seen how this money is going to be spent. Uh, I think altogether we should tell them how to spend this money. And maybe, and this money should be going back to the neighborhood. So there's something maybe, uh, maybe La Table d'Interquartier, Peter McGill can get involved in saying, okay, how are we going to access this money and how is it going to make it um, le, social housing more uh, accessible to more people? It's the, um, it's young and educated people from the so-called creative class, which is, you know, a cliche I'm sure you've heard a lot about. Empty nesters, people who want to move back from the suburbs, who want to downsize. And so that's why you have condos that are marketed in different price ranges. They're not, they're not all lux luxury condos. There are some at the lower end of market, but the market has gone up so much that actually even the low end of market is quite expensive now. And so more recently, what we have seen is the city of Montreal shifting to the policy that you may have heard of called the strategy uh, for um, inclusion of affordable housing in new housing developments. So that's a policy that they developed based on uh, other models that existed in, in, for instance, Vancouver or Washington DC or San Francisco where there has to be always uh, a certain amount of social and affordable housing in new housing developments. And that program and programs like it are kind of like a compromise in between the pressures for development on the one hand, development of market rate housing and this idea of keeping middle class people in the inner city, and on the other hand the concerns that um, we not only don't want to lose existing affordable housing, but we also want to ensure that there is a steady flow of new social and affordable housing. C'est un coin de rue, en fait, qui était complètement abandonné depuis euh, plusieurs années. Moi, je suis arrivé dans le quartier en 1996, il n'y avait rien, c'était mort. Euh, je ne sais pas tous les projets qu'ils ont eu euh, pour revitaliser la place, mais euh, bon, c'est ce qu'ils ont construit. Moi, je pense que oui, ça amène des services, ça amène des commerces qu'il n'y avait pas du tout, qui répondaient à un besoin. Euh, puis, ça a amené de l'emploi euh, quand même. Puis, euh, chaque quartier a besoin d'emploi. Euh, je pense que ça a été une bonne chose. Ça fait un petit, euh, 
un genre de petit centre-ville euh, dans Schlager. C'est des lieux où je trouve que le design sert à faire du nettoyage social de façon cachée. Pas, faire, pas forcément de façon consciente. Je pense pas qu'il y ait une, une mafia quelque part qui fasse comme « on va faire du de design euh, ». C'est comme le, le plan nettoyage social à travers des angles. Je pense pas que ce soit quelque chose qui soit comme formenté à l'avance. Mais le fait est que je pense que c'est le résultat que ça fait de créer des lieux qui sont tellement épurés, qui, pro qui, qui proposent tellement des idéaux de classe supérieure, au, au niveau économique, de classe sociale plus supérieure, que les gens qui vivent depuis longtemps dans le Chelaga Maisonneuve, puis qui ont... Euh, qui ne correspondent pas à cet idéal de classe-là, forcément, clash dans le décor, on les voit, on le sait que eux, c'est les habitants de Schlag, puis ça, que ça existe pour les habitants de Roma. C'est là, le, le clash est super évident. Oui, oh, yeah, so Schlag à Maisonneuve is, under, going under, is going through changes, much like Plateau Mont-Royal did. Now it's Plateau Mont-Royal is a more hip uh, location, and they consider that Schlag à Maisonneuve is going to be the next plateau uh, down the hill. It's to hope that the, there is a better integration of the various classes of people without forcing one class out for the other. Les gens adorent prédire le nouveau plateau à Montréal. Le Griffin Town est le nouveau plateau, Saint Henri est le nouveau plateau, Centre Sud est le nouveau plateau, je la donne dans le nouveau plateau. Puis le plateau, il y en a un, puis c'est bien, il n'y a pas besoin d'avoir 27 000 plateaux là. Puis je ne sais pas pourquoi l'imaginaire du plateau est fort dans le, dans l'imaginaire québécois, là. mais. Euh, le nouveau plateau aussi. Le nouveau plateau veut dire euh, quartier ouvrier qui a été euh, déprivé de son héritage et qui a été euh, duquel on a chassé la population euh, indigène. Ben, c'est une mauvaise nouvelle. Je la gosse pas le nouveau plateau vu comme ça. T'sais. One thing that gentrifiers classically do is that they they create neighborhood associations in which they give a new name. They try. They give a new name to the area, and they try to get that neighborhood, that new name, as being accepted. Now, in the case of Oshaga Maisonneuve, it was not the individual purchasers who tried to push for the new name. It was developers, and but the city went on board. So Oma, Oshaga Maisonneuve has become Oma, and even the arrondissement of Merci Oshaga Maisonneuve has accepted that with a little bit of hesitation, but they've accepted that. Bon, évidemment, euh, Omar, ça vient d'Oshlaga Maisonneuve. C'est euh, une, app une appellation qu'on n'a euh, qu qu pas inventée, bien sûr, mais euh, qui existait, qui ré peut-être qui référait un peu à, peut à Soho, à New York et South Houston. C'est euh, tout ça. La gentrification d'Oshlaga Maisonneuve, oui, c'est ça. Je veux dire, nous avons eu l'Olympique Stadium et toute l'Olympique installation sur le nord side. We've had the gentrification around the Place Valois, where they built a whole bunch of apartments and new uh, condominiums there. Well, well, you know, fine, gentrification will always happen. I mean, I think you're going to have to have a mixity in society, but uh, the problem with sometimes with gentrification is it pushes up the rent of the houses around, and that eventually uh, pushes out the less uh, Affluent groups. Personnellement, je trouve que c'est quand même peut-être rassurant quelque part de sentir que, les, euh, que des groupes relativement organisés qui s'opposent de façon claire à la gentrification dans un quartier, parce que je pense que, que ce mouvement-là, que le mouvement de la gentrification peut être juste plus violent, plus rapide, s'il n'y a pas une résistance quelque part, un groupe pour dire, ou des groupes pour dire comme « wow ». On habite ici, puis on ne veut pas que ça se passe n'importe comment. Puis personnellement, peut-être même qu'on ne voudrait pas que ça se passe. <rire> Est-ce qu'on peut en avoir un mot à dire? Puis, oui, dans Schlaga, il y a des groupes qui sont très radicaux, des, des gestes que je ne poserais pas moi-même. Mais, euh, à quelque part, une partie de moi qui est quand même contente de savoir qu'il y a des gens aussi organisés et aussi motivés que ça, t'sais. même si c'est ça, c'est des gestes que je ne poserais pas ou que j'endosserais pas. T'sais. Plus tôt, les gens, les gens qui l'emploient euh, voient souvent le mot, c'est relié beaucoup au mot « condo » qui fait peur. 
Mais euh, moi, je me suis toujours dit qu'un condo, mais en fait, c'est plusieurs personnes qui, 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 qui se mettent ensemble pour avoir leur propre maison. Parce qu'avoir une maison à Montréal avec un toit à quatre murs, c'est euh, hors de prix. C'est euh, très cher. Puis, euh, donc, le condo, il n'y a pas juste le condo, il y a, il y a, il y a des coopératives. Euh, c'est une façon qui. Euh, c'est une bonne façon, en fait, d'habiter dans un quartier. J'ai pas accès à des statistiques, euh, quoi que ce soit, mais euh, je sais que nous, ici, dans le commerce, on voit beaucoup de, de, de femmes qui arrivent avec des poussettes, des bébés, euh, beaucoup plus que dans d'autres quartiers, euh, je crois. Euh, je crois qu'il y a des familles ouais, dans le quartier, vraiment. J'ai un ami qui était sur une, une terrasse sur le plateau Mont-Royal il y a quelques temps, puis qui entendait des gens à côté de lui parler. Euh, une personne en particulier qui disait qu'elle était bien déçue parce qu'elle était supposée de rentrer dans son, condo, dans son nouveau condo dans Schlaga, Maisonneuve, euh, en juillet, puis qu'il ne pourrait pas parce que l'appartement avait brûlé, puis qu'il fallait attendre encore quelques mois le temps que la construction se refasse. Puis la personne en parlait comme si c'était un accident ou un hasard que son condo ait brûlé. Alors que c'est moindrement que les nouveaux arrivants se mettaient au, au parfum de ce qui se passe dans leur nouveau quartier, comprendraient tout de suite que c'est des activistes qui ne qui veulent pas d'eux ou qui ne veulent pas de la façon dont c'est fait dans ce quartier-là et qui ont brûlé leur futur lieu de vie. Est-ce que ça peut être plus clair dans la tête de quelqu'un? Je ne sais pas, mais le fait est que ces nouveaux arrivants-là, qui, qui eux veulent vivre dans Oma et non en Schlagan maison neuve étaient zéro au fait du de toute le, le, la mobilisation anti-gentrification dans leur nouveau quartier. Fait. Des fois, je me dis, ben, si, si on veut comme, sensibiliser les gens qui vont venir s'installer à comment, pas comment ça fonctionne dans Schlaga, parce qu'on ne brûle pas systématiquement les trucs, mais de la réalité historique et actuelle du quartier, ben, je ne sais pas. Juste derrière, on avait toujours les Corangas, les rail yards up until 1980, and then they converted into what you have now. But the, but the Cor Angus, it's another example of poorly planned, because there's no uh, uh, service de proximité. Uh, you know, the panels, you have, they have one shopping center, low blas at the core west, southwest corner, and that's it. I think we have all of these expectations for urban planning to, to stop things we don't like, or we, we have all these expectations of urban planning to create the city that we want. But when it comes down to it, all urban planning can do really is, is create the box, is create the guidelines. I mean, you can't say we need a bakery here and we need a, you know, a hardware store there. That's not what an urban planner does. And do we really want, you know, somebody controlling the city to that level of detail? Because When it comes down to it, if we did have somebody controlling the city to that level of detail, would they really put the things that we wanted there? Would they even be able to think of some of the things that we love about this city to plan them into the city? I doubt it. I think what you need is that room for flexibility and that room for creativity. And that's what you get when you have a really mixed neighborhood where you do have the old and the new and the rich and maybe the, the more creative and the more working class all you know living the city in different ways in the same physical environment. Il faut, il faut tout à fait pour la mixité sociale. Euh, on peut pas un quartier ne peut pas euh, se retrouver avec seulement avec une une classe de personnes ou juste des gens qui ont euh, une tranche de revenus que ça soit euh, plus vers le haut, plus vers le bas. Euh, je, je... Je pense qu'il faut, il faut une mixité dans, dans le quartier qui a peut-être un peu plus maintenant qu'avant. Je pense que c'est une bonne chose. Souvent, les cafés sont vus comme les lieux qui, qui vont euh, alimenter la gentrification. Puis ça ça m'est arrivé quand je commençais à travailler au café ici de voir des, des promoteurs immobiliers rentrer avec un client pour faire « Regardez, il y a un beau petit café ici, vous allez pouvoir venir écrire » puis d'être comme mais nous, on existe pour les familles à faible revenu, on existe pour les gens marginaux, on essaie de garder nos menus le moins cher possible, même si c'est difficile, on essaie de les garder le moins cher possible pour que ça reste accessible. Tu sais. Il y a des plats plus fancy qu'on qu vend à perte pour être sûr que les gens du quartier soient quand même capables de se payer ces déjeuners-là qui sont comme plus exotiques. En tout cas, je m'écarte un peu. Ici, à Pointe-Saint-Charles, 
in uh, 2007, 2008, um, when the CN site um, went up for, well, was, had already been sold and there was this whole idea of redeveloping it, um, the uh, radicals in the neighborhood were sort of saying, okay, look, what, how can we contribute to, to this? How can we make it such that there'd be part of this space that be, we could reclaim? And uh, one of the ideas was to, um, was to uh, get a building, occupy a building, one of the abandoned buildings, to set up the autonomous social center. So originally that was the idea. And for, for several years, uh, for, for a while we were like, okay, which building are we going to squat on the site and everything else? But then at some point we were um, realizing that, uh, we were realizing, we were made to realize that um, the strategy of many of the organizations in the neighborhood was not necessarily a direct action strategy with respect to that space, the CN site. So the Autonomous Social Center who wanted to occupy, we were sort of made to understand and we understood that if we came in and occupied on the site, we might actually interfere with the gains that uh, the neighborhood might have on the site. So that's why we decided to not squat the CN site. We decided to squat on, Sherit on um, the Saracon uh, factory, which was the last um, industrial space left on the Lachine Canal that had not been transformed into condos. Um, so symbolically it was a very important um, building to occupy. So we, um, we went in um, in um, May 2009, the Autonomous Social Centre occupied the uh, Saracon uh, building on the Lachine Canal. Um, we had a huge support demonstration. There was over 500 people who came to support the demonstration. It was an amazing festive event, um, but tense as well because we were, you know, going along and uh, walking through the neighborhood, you know, uh, talking about gentrification and everything else. And then at one point, uh, part of the demonstration went off and occupied the building. The, the, it was a real victory in June uh, when uh, we finally signed the agreement to. Uh, to donate the building, the, the, the Vincent Caria, Caria finally, after years of struggle, agreed to donate the building for a dollar. He donated part of the land, he's decontaminating, and he's uh, giving us $850,000 so that we can uh, um, renovate the, uh, the exterior. This was part of a, a two-year struggle, actually a four-year struggle, um, with many different people in the neighborhood, organizations, including the social center, the autonomous social center, and uh, it was a big victory. Je pense que c'est une vague qui déferle sur Montréal, mais je pense que le fait que dans peut-être dans le sud-ouest puis dans le centre-sud de Schlaga, le fait que les loyers sont encore moins chers qu'ailleurs, que comme je disais, il y a beaucoup de loyers en état de décrépitude avancée qu'on peut juste mettre à terre et reconstruire dessus avec une plus grande valeur, un plus grand profit de revente. Ça aussi, ça peut être intéressant pour des promoteurs. Fait que je pense que c'est pour ça qu'on le voit particulièrement dans nos quartiers. Puis je pense que, là, je parle peut-être à travers mon chapeau, mais j'ai l'impression que des quartiers comme le Plateau ont des, une réglementation qui fait qu'on ne peut pas détruire certains immeubles parce qu'ils ont une plus grande protection du patrimoine. Tandis que je pense que dans ces quartiers-là, c'est un peu plus lousse. Fait que c'est possible de détruire des édifices qui ont une valeur historique ou patrimoniale pour construire dessus parce que c'est moins réglementé puis on laisse les propriétaires laisser des trucs de valeur à l'abandon. Um, the, um, the neighborhood, the face of the neighborhood is changing. I mean, there's, um, um, there are more condos in the neighborhood and there are more um, sort of young professionals moving into the neighborhood. There's no question about that. Um, now, um, I think that that's not necessarily a problem. What becomes a problem is when people fr who live here, currently live here, are forced to leave. So I think that um, the proportion of social housing that we have in this neighborhood, which is around 40%, protects 40% of, um, of the housing stock is protected from gentrification. So that means that people who live here can currently stay here. That's what gentrification is about, you know, moving people out so, um, and replacing a certain class or a certain community by another. And so you have people coming in, but you know what? They're participating. Many of them are participating in the, in the life of the community. So it's not like as if we're saying, oh, we don't want anybody new in here. What we're saying is we don't want any luxury condos like we have on the Lachine Canal. And what we're saying is we want um, condos that are, um, you know, mixed in with social housing and with, house with uh, you know, um, rental housing and whatever, affordable rental housing and not uh, super high rental housing and everything else. We want a mix mixture. That's what we're saying here. And I think that to some extent we're managing to, you know, work within that framework. Um, there have, from, if, if I'm 
Uh, si je me trompe pas, if I don't, um, I think that there, there are no luxury condos that have been built uh, for quite a while. Most condos that are being built are what they consider affordable um, condos, which are not really affordable to people who live here, but they're not really expensive. It's not, you know, rich people moving in. Lachine Canal is completely out now, you know, it's clear. <laughs> I think that was a failure and uh, an échec, and that was um, um, for many reasons. Ça, c'est le comité Bail, qui est situé à Chagomaisonneuve, qui... Uh, qui m'ont sorti cette statistique-là, mais ce qui est encore plus frappant dans la maison neuve par rapport, mettons, au plateau de Mont-Royal, c'est qu'au plateau de Mont-Royal, on prenait des appartements, puis on les transformait en condos. Mais la façade, au niveau architectural, ça restait la même chose. Tandis que dans Schlaga maison neuve on prend des vieux buildings en état de décomposition avancée, on les met à terre et on bâtit du neuf. Ça que ça brise la trame architecturale du quartier, ça vient vraiment euh, appuyer, j'ai l'impression, sur le... le le, le clou de la gentrification, c'est que non seulement la population change, mais en plus, on détruit, on construit du neuf. On... C'est comme s'il y avait quelque chose d'encore plus euh, déstabilisant pour les gens qui habitent là depuis longtemps, de voir non seulement du nouveau monde arriver, mais de voir carrément le, le quartier euh, changer de visage. Where gentrification started very, very quietly in the late 19, in the in the early 1970s, but of course, but of course took off. It was always really, really mixed. If you look at the history of the plateau, even if you walk around, you can get a sense of it. There were some streets that were built that were very working class, the ones that have no front yards, and there's others that are much more, uh, much larger, much more uh, ornate. It was always it was always really mixed. It wasn't. Um, a uniformly working class neighborhood. That's St. Henry in point. But nevertheless, obviously nobody nobody would even dream of um, of investing in the plateau until until that that um, what can I say, cultural investment had already been made by people who were involved in the you know, alternative social movements and so on and for the Saint Louis Milan section until the Italians and Portuguese had already started investing. You know, you know, Adam, even in the mid-1980s, um, I can tell you this, the, when we, we first started looking around for a place to buy, we were looking at a place on Clark, and the bank said, yeah, not a good street, we don't know if we give you a mortgage on Clark. This is in my land. I mean, it really depends what people want. If people want to buy a property, it's really hard to do that in Montreal, and it's almost impossible to buy a property with a yard and three bedrooms in Montreal. Um, or if it's not impossible, it's going to cost you more than you earn. I don't really want to buy a property, <laughs> so it's not a problem for me because it's pretty freaking easy to rent a reasonable place with a few bedrooms and, and maybe, you know, at least balconies or a yard. Um, that that's really a great place to raise kids. I was raised in apartments in Montreal, so I guess maybe I'm biased to it, but it's certainly what I would envision doing if I have uh, kids one day. There's condos that look exactly like duplexes in the plateau, and those probably would attract families with kids as long as they were, you know, at least somewhat affordable. Um, if we're talking these big blocks, you know, with a tower and one or two bedrooms, obviously it's not ideal for a family. Comme je disais, je pense pas qu'une famille avec plus que deux enfants, à moins que les deux parents aient un bon salaire. Moi, personnellement, euh, comme je disais, le, le prix de mon loyer en ce moment, c'est 1495. On est quatre à le payer, mais c'est un loyer assez grand pour avoir une famille de trois, quatre enfants. Mais s'il y avait juste une personne pour payer ce loyer-là, je... Quand, je, justement, ce, ce printemps, j'étais en recherche d'appartements, puis ça arrivait des fois qu'on visitait des six ou des sept et demi, puis qu'il y avait des familles après nous qui venaient les visiter. J'avais vraiment une pensée pour ça, parce que je me disais comment, si, si moi, j'étais à leur place, ma recherche d'appartements serait une source de stress incroyable dans ma vie. Voyant le prix des loyers, voyant que... Techniquement, on ne devrait pas mettre plus que le tiers de notre revenu à, à payer un loyer, mais eux, une famille sur l'île de Montréal, j'ai l'impression qu'ils doivent en mettre beaucoup, pas mal plus que ça. I think that uh, it's a question of whether or not um, people are organized and, ha and have a power base that uh, based 
that, that emerges from that organization. I think people know, like, you know, people who are living in a neighborhood who don't have much money or who are badly, you know, poorly housed, they know. Like, I don't know what it's like elsewhere, but here, this is a very organized neighborhood, like you say, but there's a thousand families on a waiting list for social housing units in this neighborhood. And there's only 6,000 doors. So that's a huge percentage. So this, th I mean, I'm sure this is the same in all the neighborhoods, any kind of neighborhood that has a sort of a working class or a popular component to it. I'm sure that there's lots of people waiting on housing lists. And I'm sure those folks know. They know, they see what's going on. So it's a question of whether there's, there's a way to sort of organize and take, bring that all together. And I think that there are organizations in all the neighborhoods of, of Montreal. And um, I think that Point St. Charles has, a per has that particularity of being a very small neighborhood. We've got only a population of 13,000 people here, 13, 14,000 people. So it's a village, in, in an urban village, which makes it much easier to organize. And it has that history of, uh, of um, being, always being you know, very political um, for various reasons, because it was a working class neighborhood, because McGill and University of Montreal students came down here to organize in the 60s and 70s. All these kinds of things contributed to a neighborhood which today is very politicized and quite autonomous and, uh, and quite in your face, right? So I can't, you can't compare that to, to, to Côte de Neige, where there's hundreds of thousands of people in a neighborhood. And it's all multi-ethnic. Um, there's a, it's a completely different dynamic here. It's very, very homogenous. Le mot gentrification dit rien à pas mal de monde. Quoi que quand tu leur décris le phénomène, ils savent exactement de quoi tu parles. Mais le terme pour en parler, beaucoup de monde savent même pas euh, que ça existe. Puis, euh, en fait, ça peut faire un exercice super intéressant parce que quand on était, euh, quand le programme particulier d'urbanisme pour le quartier Sainte-Marie, qui est le quartier dans lequel le Touski se trouve a été lancé euh, à l'hiver dernier, au mois de mars. Euh, le tout ce qui on était intéressé à aller aux consultations publiques et à présenter un contre-mémoire. Donc, on s'est dit à un moment donné, pendant une assemblée générale, on va mettre des posters pour savoir s'il y a, un peu partout dans le quartier, on va mettre des affiches pour savoir s'il y a d'autres personnes du quartier qui seraient intéressées à en discuter avec nous. Et on a été super surpris par le résultat, mais il y a eu comme 35 personnes qui sont venues à la première réunion, puis des gens qu'on n'avait jamais vus, c'était pas nos amis. C'est des gens qui avaient vu les affiches, qui s'étaient sentis interpellés. Il y avait du monde dans la soixantaine, du monde qui n'avait pas 20 ans, il y avait du monde qui était propriétaire, il y avait du monde qui était locataire, il y avait du monde de partout. Puis on a, ensemble, on a écrit un mémoire qu'on a, qu a présenté à l'Office de consultation publique de Montréal, dans lequel on propose une alternative au programme particulier d'urbanisme, dans lequel on s'oppose au fait qu'on nous annonce qu'il va y avoir 2000 nouveaux logements dans le quartier, mais qu'on ne nous dit pas si c'est des condos, si c'est des coops, qu'est-ce que c'est? Nous, on veut qu'ils... Donc, on, ça a vraiment été un exercice euh, citoyen, si on veut, qui a été euh, vraiment bénéfique et enrichissant, je pense, pour les gens qui ont participé, de se mobiliser ensemble, puis de, de parler de notre quartier entre nous, puis de savoir qu'est-ce qu'on veut. Puis, mais en même temps, de se sentir tellement impuissant, de présenter notre mémoire devant l'Office de consultation publique, puis d'être comme... Ils vont faire leurs recommandations, mais... Au final, qu'est-ce que ça va faire? Fait que c'est facile de tomber dans le cynisme parce qu'on sent tellement qu'ils nous ont présenté le programme particulier d'urbanisme. Puis on sentait tellement qu'il y avait des, des, des choses tellement décidées à l'avance, comme l'avenir du IGA, de la place Frontenac là-bas. Là. Tout ça était coulé dans le béton, mais dans, dans le PPU, ils nous ont laissé croire que peut-être qu'ils allaient faire une place publique pour finalement qu'on leur tire les verres du nez en consultation publique et qu'ils nous disent il y a déjà un promoteur qui a fait une offre d'achat. Des, des affaires que t'es comme... Mais pourquoi on est ici à en parler si vous avez toutes déjà décidé ce qui allait se passer avec notre quartier? Fait que c'est bien beau l'exercice. Le, Justement, c'est pour ça que j'utilise le mot « citoyenneté » avec un peu d'ironie par moment, parce que je suis comme... Euh, les consultations citoyennes, là. In the point, what happened around this CN site was that we managed to get for the first time ever what we call a pre-consultation. Because normally in the process of a, of building, of a, of a development um, of this... Uh, nature. There's a con consul consultation organized by l'Office de Consultation Publique de Montréal where essentially what happens is that the capitalist promoter comes in and says, look, this is my project. And then citizens or community organizations or whoever will come and say, okay, I agree with this or I disagree with this or whatever. And then there's a report that's produced and then the city can force or not the, um, the, the real estate developer or the promoter or the developer to do X or Y. 
That's usually how it happens. Now what we did here is we said, look, this is not how it's going to happen. We're going to have a pre-consultation. We, we, we actually managed to get the city to agree to organizing a pre-consultation, organized by l'Office de Consultation Publique de Montréal, which is the first time in the history of Montreal. And um, at this pre-consultation, what happened was that the, the developer, yes, he presented his project, but so did other actors. So you've got on, in, in front of you not just the promoter's project, you've got everyone else's projects as well. So you had the project of the, of the Autonomous Social Center, you had projects by citizens committees, you had projects by, um, by um, um, the um, CDEC, you had different kinds of projects being presented um, on the same um, equal footing. And then the debate was on all of these. And then after that, there was the actual official consultation on the promoter's project, which had already changed because of the pre-consultation. So this actually, I think, had a big impact in terms of the, um, the, uh, the capacity to develop a site according to the needs of the community. I think that there is a long way to go in terms of creating a real authentic participation. Um, you know, I, I did say that I think there's more awareness of a lot of the human issues uh, and economic issues and, and gentrification, everything at both a municipal level and a grassroots level, that doesn't necessarily mean it's always being, you know, respected or treated the way everybody would like it to be. I think for me, I've accepted that the city is going to change and it would honestly be a shame if it didn't keep growing and changing um, and hopefully becoming more sustainable and more pleasant to be in. But at the same time, to me, you know, if I could have one wish for the city, uh, one sort of thread that connects a lot of the different opinions that I put forth on Facing Montreal is that I think what we want in a city is resilience. We want the city to be able to bounce back. We want it to be able to adapt. We want it to be able to change. We want it to be able to live. And the, the projects um, or the new developments that worry me or that cause me um, you know, that I, I am yeah, anxious about are those that I feel don't have that kind of a resilience built in. And when we're talking about things like taking away these um, century old triplex buildings with commercial on the ground floor and residential above, which have been in business for 130 years, maybe not the same business, but one business goes and another business, you know, be it a shop or a restaurant or a grocery can easily fill in the same space and keep it alive. Um, if you're talking about taking that away and building, you know, a big box store or building a mall, is that the kind of space that can be used and recycled and re-inhabited and rethought time and again? Or are we really painting ourselves into a very rigid corner based on what's perceived as a, you know, a want or a need of the present day? Je le vois arriver à la porte Il se trompe 5, 6 fois de code 424 B1 Il se rappelle plus très bien Il est sous comme un coin Il faut qu'il se souvienne du chemin Troisième porte à droite Deuxième étage à gauche Ça l'énerve, ça le saoule Heureusement que toi t'es là Pour qu'il se défoule Il a l'alcool mauvais Comme toutes les autres journées Il a envie de te frapper Ça lui donne la puissance Qu'il a jamais trouvé Ça lui donne la confiance De sentir au-dessus Son grand frère de la terre Au football L'été nul à l'école Il prend bleu détesté Il avait honte 